Another important organ that is not only involved in the human reproductive cycle but also involved in the development of the child following childbirth is the human female breast and this will be the focus of this lecture. So we're going to begin by briefly focusing on the anatomy of the breast and then we're going to focus on its function. So let's begin by taking the following by looking at the following diagram that describes the cross section of one of the female human breasts. Now, to the right of the actual breast, we have the rib cage, and these are the ribs shown in brown. Now, connecting the ribs are the intercostal muscles shown in red, and in front of the entire rib cage, we have these muscles shown in pink known as the pectoralis muscle. So, we have the major and the minor pectoralis muscle, and the pectoralis muscle is actually connected to the breast via connective tissue. Now, what about the breast itself? So the breast is found to the left of the pectoralis muscle, and it's this entire structure here. Now, at the center of the breast, we have the mammary gland, and the mammary gland consists of the lobules of granular tissue, also known as alveoli, as well as the milk ducts. Now, the lobes of granular tissue are these grape-like structures that consist of specialized gland cells, specialized secretory cells, that that produce and release milk. And when the milk is produced and released, it is released into these milk ducts. And these ducts act as passageways. They allow the movement of the milk from the lobules of granular tissue and to the nipple, where the nipple has very tiny holes that allows the passageway of the milk out of that breast. Now, the nipple also contains nerve endings, as we'll see in just a moment. And when the baby suckles on the nipple, the nerve essentially creates action potentials, electrical signals that propagate all the way to the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus stimulates the posterior and anterior pituitary gland to basically release special hormones, as we'll see in just a moment. And these hormones stimulate the process of lactation, the production and the release of milk. Now, we also have these ligaments of Cooper, and the lig uh, ligaments of Cooper are essentially these fibrous bands of connective tissue that connect the entire breast to the skin that encloses the breast. And we also have this adipose tissue, the fat tissue, shown in orange. And the fat tissue basically determines the size of the breast, and it also determines the softness of the breast. Of the breast. So the more fat we have in the breast, the larger the breasts are. Now, we also have these blood vessels, and the blood vessels consist of arteries as well as of veins. The arteries carry the oxygenated and nutrient-filled blood to the cells of the breast, while the veins carry away the deoxygenated and uh, deoxygenated blood that contains the waste products away from the cells found inside the breast. And finally, around the nipple, we have this relatively dark region of tissue known as the areola. So the areola is a small circular structure that is colored differently than the surrounding tissue and this is found around the actual nipple. So this is the brief structure, the brief anatomy of the human female breast. Now let's move on to the function of the female human breast. Well, the primary function of the female breast is to basically produce milk via process known as lactation, as we'll discuss in just a moment. And the, and the purpose of the milk is to basically provide that child with the nourishment that the child needs to basically grow and develop into a fully functional individual. And the milk is also used to boost, to increase the immunity of that child, as we'll see in just a moment. So during the process of pregnancy, when that woman is carrying that fetus and the fetus is undergoing different types of developmental pro uh, processes, that woman is actually releasing estrogen as well as progesterone. So initially, these two hormones are released by the corpus luteum found in the ovary, but eventually the placenta 
takes over this job and begins to release estrogen and progesterone. And what these two hormones do is they stimulate the lobules of granular tissue and the ducts to actually increase in size. And this ultimately increases the size of the breasts themselves. Now, for a few days following childbirth, the breasts will produce a fluid known as colostrum. Now, colostrum is also known as first milk. And colostrum is a yellowish substance that is rich in protein and lactose, but has a relatively low concentration of fat. And this is usually produced before childbirth and following childbirth for, for several days. Also following childbirth, what happens is the interior pituitary gland will release a hormone known as prolactin. And what prolactin does is it stimulates the memory gland. It stimulates the gland cells in the memory gland to basically produce milk that is different than colostrum. Now, the major difference between milk and the first milk is that milk actually contains a high concentration of carbohydrates as well as fat. And what the milk does is it once again provides immunity to the child by giving the child special types of antibodies and the antibodies can be used to fight off different types of pathogens that might infect that growing child. Now what the milk also does is it provides the proteins and the carbohydrates and the nutrients, the minerals that are needed by that child to actually develop into a fully functional individual. Now let's actually discuss how the process of lactation actually takes place. And let's take a look at the following diagram. So we have the child and we have the breast of the mother. Now these are the memory glands. So this is the memory gland. It contains the lobes of granular tissue as well as our ducts. Now let's zoom in on one of these uh, lobes. So we basically get the following diagram. We have these gland cells that can produce the milk as well as release the milk. And outside the, uh, outside the cells, we have a layer of muscle. And this is our milk duct that can receive the milk and carry that milk to the mouth of that child. So when the child essentially suckles on that nipple, the nipple contains nerve cells and these nerve cells generate action potential electrical signals and the electrical signals is carried to the hypothalamus of the brain of that mother. And what the hypothalamus does is it stimulates the posterior pituitary gland to release a hormone known as oxytocin. And what oxytocin does is it travels via the blood system them and eventually reaches the muscle layer of this particular diagram. So when the muscle layer receives the oxytocin, what the oxytocin does is it stimulates the muscle layer to actually contract. And by contracting, what the muscle layer does is it forces that milk, it squeezes that milk out of the cells and into these milk ducts. And then the milk travels via the ducts through the tiny holes in the nipple and eventually into the mouth of that baby. So this is how lactation actually takes place. This is how we form the milk and eventually release the milk into the mouth of that fetus. So once again, what exactly are the effects, the positive effects of the process of breastfeeding? So uh, uh, we see that during breastfeeding, our hypothalamus stimulates the anterior pituitary gland to basically release oxytocin. Now oxytocin doesn't only stimulate the release of the milk, but it also actually stimulates the mother's uterus to return to its normal size and shape. So function number one of breastfeeding is it stimulates the uterus of the mother to return to its original size. And function number two, and perhaps the most, the more obvious function and effect of breastfeeding is it provides nutrients to that growing child. And it also provides antibodies to that child, which actually boosts the immunity of that child. It gives the child passive immunity and it increases the likelihood that pathogens that might invade that child will be found by the child's immune system and will be killed off before actually infecting that child.